A woman was found dead in her own apartment, but the police couldn't find any clues. When the case became known throughout the city, they received a tip from a witness that turned the investigation upside down and ultimately led to the truth. As a result, the case became one of the most discussed in the country as no one could have expected such horror. Shauna T. Fay was born on March 13, 1966 in Salt Lake City, USA. She was a cheerful and energetic woman, a member of the school cheerleading team, and had many friends. After completing her education, Shauna worked for some time in her home state, but at the age of 29, she decided to move to Las Vegas. She liked the vibrant pace of the city, which offered many more opportunities to earn money. After moving, Shauna worked as a cosmetic salesperson in several elite firms, but in 2001, she decided to become a waitress at the Palms Casino. At that time, the establishment had just opened, but it quickly became one of the most popular casinos in Vegas. It was at this job that Shauna met her future husband, George. Before we continue, I have a small request for you. We've created a new channel where we upload content related to old, historical ruins and interesting events. So, if you're interested, kindly subscribe to my channel, Decoverize, for daily interesting videos and show some love in the comments. I'll read every one of your comments. The link is in the description. He often visited the casino and a romance quickly developed between them. A year after they met, the couple had a daughter, Madison. A few years later, they officially got married. It seemed that this family had a happy and carefree future ahead of them. George worked as a firefighter, paid a lot of attention to his wife and daughter, and always took care of them. Shauna worked at the casino earning quite decent money there, but in 2008 their relationship began to deteriorate. Due to the financial crisis, George lost a considerable portion of his savings, which were invested in real estate. On this basis, he became nervous and irritable, increasingly venting his anger on his wife and daughter. Eventually, the woman decided that they should live separately. For some time and moved into her own apartment. The couple went to a family psychologist, but no improvements were observed in their relationship and they increasingly discussed divorce. Another blow to Shauna was that her apartment was robbed. While she was at work, several valuable items were taken from her home, including her engagement ring. But a strange separate detail was that the thief also took her panties, leaving men's underwear in the apartment. The woman reported the incident to the police, but they could not identify the perpetrator. On the morning of September 29, 2012, three weeks after the incident, George picked up his daughter from her grandmother and went to Shauna's apartment to retrieve some of the girl's belongings. They continued to share custody of their daughter and she was supposed to spend a few days with him. As they approached the apartment, they saw that the garage door was open. When they entered the apartment, they were met with a gruesome sight. Shauna was lying on the floor, blood everywhere. Her eight-year-old daughter witnessed a horrific scene. George immediately called the police and reported what had happened. The 911 operator asked them to go outside with the woman and wait for the officers. Investigators began to study the crime scene and determined that Shauna was likely attacked near the stairs on the second floor of the apartment. The house was in complete chaos. Many things were scattered and broken, indicating a struggle between the victim and the perpetrator. Medical experts found serious injuries on Shauna's body and initially thought that her death may have been caused by a gunshot wound. However, they soon realized that all these injuries were inflicted by a heavy blunt object, most likely a hammer. After interviewing neighbors, the police received two leads between 3.30 and 4 o'clock a.m. One of the residents in the same building heard some noise from the woman's apartment. He didn't pay much attention to it because he knew that Shauna was coming home from work at that time. Another neighbor found her phone, documents, and cosmetics on a nearby street, which indicated that the perpetrator either intentionally threw them away while fleeing the apartment or accidentally dropped them. Investigators reconstructed the timeline of events that night. On surveillance cameras at the casino and its parking lot, they saw Shauna finishing her shift and leaving for the parking lot. Nothing on the footage indicated that the woman was alarmed or in any danger. Detectives concluded that the killer was likely already in her apartment when she returned home. As usual, the first suspicion fell on her husband George. The police have already found out that the couple was getting ready for a divorce. They also talked to Shauna's friends and learned about the problems in their relationship. Everything looked as if he really fit the role of a killer. However, the detective found that the man had an unquestionable alibi for that night. He was on a 12-hour shift at the fire department. This was confirmed by all his colleagues and camera recordings. Thus, the police did not have any serious clues. They immediately learned that the woman's apartment was robbed three weeks earlier. 
and tried to understand if there was any connection between these events. The version was being developed that the robber might have returned but did not have time to leave the house before Shauna arrived. A struggle broke out between them and he killed her. Meanwhile, the victim's sister continued to suspect George and what had happened. She was constantly talking to Shauna and knew about all the problems in their relationship, about his constant jealousy and scandals. However, his alibi was unquestionable. Therefore, the police focused on searching for other clues. A day after the discovery of the body, they received the first serious lead. By that time, the killer was being talked about in all the local news, which drew the attention of Vegas residents. A man who knew a homeless person called Greyhound turned to the police. He told this witness that he killed the woman with a hammer. According to the man, Greyhound talked about it with joy and even laughed. Given that the details of the murder were not disclosed in the media, this lead became key for the detectives. They found out that the witness lived in a tent on the outskirts of the city and often met with Greyhound near the Albertson store. Together with him, they went there and started waiting. Very soon, the witness saw him and reported to the police, who immediately approached the suspect. During the search, they found banned substances on him, which allowed them to arrest Greyhound. In the police station, the officers found out that his real name was Noel Stevens. He had been repeatedly convicted of petty thefts and possession of various substances, but the man denied his involvement in the murder. And the investigators really doubted his candidacy as a suspect. First, he only committed minor offenses and it was difficult to imagine why this homeless person would kill someone. Secondly, he lived practically at the other end of the city, which made the choice of the victim completely incomprehensible. It took him several hours to get to Sean. House while many really valuable things in her apartment were untouched, including cash. None of this made any sense. However, the police continued to investigate his involvement. They found a tent where Stevens lived and conducted a search. The tent was located outside the city in a remote desert area. While examining the area around it, investigators found several significant pieces of evidence. Just a few meters away, they discovered the suspect's pants and underwear covered in blood as well as a hammer tag. Later, experts determined that the blood belonged to Sean Atife. However, the main clue was waiting for them at the police station. By gaining access to Noel's smartphone, they found only one contact in his notebook, George Tifei's number. At this point, the case took an unexpected turn. From conversations with Shauna's friends and relatives, investigators learned that George had been friends with a homeless man for several years, whom he entrusted with various household and yard work. The woman often complained about him to her acquaintances when he came to fix something. According to her, he behaved strangely and even creepily. But George never took her concern seriously. Thus, detectives found the missing link between the killer and the victim. But the main question remained whether George had any involvement in this or if Stevens chose the woman as a victim simply because he knew Shauna and her work schedule. With the help of the hammer tag, the police found out when and where the hammer, which was most likely the murder weapon, was purchased. By requesting surveillance camera footage, they were shocked to see Stevens and George T. Fay walking into the store and buying the same hammer. At this point, investigators realized that Shauna's husband could indeed be the mastermind behind this horrific murder. When all this evidence was presented to Stevens, he finally decided to confess to what he had done. The man admitted that he did indeed kill Shauna, but only on the orders of her husband. According to Stevens, George paid him $600 for it. They had been planning this crime for several months. The man bought dark clothes for Stevens and gave him a duplicate of the keys to her apartment. Three weeks before the murder, he asked the homeless man to break into her house and stage a robbery so that later the police would be confused and conduct their investigation along that line. On the night of the murder, Stevens snuck into her apartment again and waited for the woman to come home. After she arrived and began to walk up to the second floor, he came out of his hiding place and attacked her. Stevens said he struck her about 17 times, causing the hammer to break. The killer agreed to show detectives the location, near a campsite where he buried his weapon. With Stevens' confession and a multitude of evidence, the police charged George. His relatives were shocked because he had always been a caring and loving family man who helped people. Upon learning of the accusations, George's sister called him and told him that he was suspected of murder. However, at the exit, the man crashed into a fence and flew off the road. The police who arrived at the scene concluded that he deliberately caused the accident in an attempt to take his own life and there were no tire marks on the path of the car. George did not even try to brake, but only pressed on the gas pedal. However, he did not succeed in his goal. With medium injuries, the man was taken to the local hospital. 
Two days later, the police informed him that he was arrested for murder. George's reaction was very calm. He asked to contact his lawyer and also to allow him to take a shower and brush his teeth. From that moment on, the police department began preparing to transfer the case to court. Three months later, Noel Stevens agreed to make a full confession in exchange for a waiver of the death penalty. George TFA refused to admit his guilt and the trial against him only began three years later in August 2015. At the hearings, he did not utter a word, entrusting all the work to his lawyer. His relatives acted as witnesses and spoke about how George could never have done such a thing to his wife and could not be involved in her murder. That Stevens killed Shauna on his own initiative and her husband knew nothing about it. According to the lawyer, the store camera footage did not prove anything. It only showed how George and Noel were buying tools that the latter needed for housework. The prosecution did not believe in such a scenario. In court, they presented a printout of George's phone calls, according to which the man called Stevens 87 times in September 2012, five of which were made shortly before the murder. Based on Stevens' testimony, the prosecution concluded that money was the motive for the murder. George lost a significant portion of his savings due to the crisis, resulting in Sean becoming the main breadwinner in the family. She earned over $100,000 a year, while George's income was only half that amount. He realized that in the event of a divorce or a property division, he would be left with nothing, so he decided to get rid of his wife. Stevens initially didn't believe him when he spoke about the murder. Prior to this, they had been friends for several years and Noel had actually done various work around the house and property for a small fee to kill his wife, and he agreed. According to his testimony, the man planned to get this money from an insurance company after Shauna's death. Despite Stevens revealing all the details of the murder and how he and George planned the crime, there were certain difficulties during the trial. The results of Stevens' medical examination were presented during the hearing, which showed and regularly took potent banned substances. He did not deny either of these points, so all of his words were questioned by the defense lawyer. Because of this, neither side was sure of the outcome when the jurors began to deliberate. It took them three days. In the end, George T. Fay was found guilty of conspiring to commit murder. When the judge pronounced these words, George showed no emotion. He was sentenced to life in prison with an additional 81 years for the remaining charges, including conspiracy to break into a home and robbery. Soon after the verdict, George filed a 107-page appeal in which he confessed to the crime in the third person. He wrote that prescription drugs had clouded his mind, causing him to be unable to distinguish between good and evil. All of this led him to believe that killing his wife would be the only way to protect their child. George revealed that he had suffered a serious injury several years before the murder, but the court did not appoint a psychological examination for him. Despite this, in 2017, the court rejected his appeal because there was no reason to doubt that his mental state prevented him from clearly understanding what was happening. Since George's arrest, their daughter has been living with her maternal grandmother and has been actively helped by her sister Shauna. At one point, this girl lost both of her parents and learned what a monster her father was. He deliberately took her to the apartment, knowing in advance what she would see. Obviously, he did this to provide a more reliable alibi without caring about the consequences for his child's mental health. As for Stevens, he received a 42-year prison sentence. Considering that this man spent most of his life on the streets, it would be foolish to consider such a sentence as punishment. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like the video. A girl stayed overnight at her friend's house and disappeared without a trace in the morning. The bedroom window was wide open and all her belongings were left in the room. Police began searching for her, but none of them suspected the dark secrets they would soon uncover in the small town. She grew up in a large and friendly family with several brothers and sisters. Later, they moved with their parents to Spring Hill, Florida, where Amanda attended the local middle school. She was passionate about dancing, writing poetry, playing multiple musical instruments, and was a very positive child. During school vacations, Amanda always went to her grandparents' house in a small town called White Cloud. She loved spending time there as she had many friends in the town. White Cloud was a quiet and peaceful place with a population of only 1,400 people. Most of its residents knew each other, children played without supervision, and no one worried about their safety. In 2004, when she was only 13 years old, Amanda finished the seventh grade of middle school and went to White Cloud for the whole summer. She spent a lot of time with her friends, went for walks, and enjoyed her vacation. 
On June 20th, Amanda stayed overnight at her best friend's house. They talked, had fun, and went to bed late at night. In the morning, her friend woke up and found that Amanda was not in the room. The bedroom windows were wide open. She went to the kitchen, walked around the house, but Amanda was nowhere to be found. It was strange because all her belongings, including clothes and a backpack, were left in the bedroom. The friend told her parents that Amanda was missing and they called her grandparents. They walked several streets and called the parents of Amanda's other friends, but no one had seen her. Then the relatives decided to go to the police. They understood that Amanda could not have gone anywhere without warning, especially in just her pajamas. First investigators talked to Amanda's friend. According to her, she didn't hear anything that night, and Amanda never told her that she was planning to leave. At the time of the disappearance, the friend's parents, as well as her brother and sister, were in the house. None of them heard or saw anything. Police tried to find witnesses who lived near the house, but they also hit a dead end. On that night, no residents noticed anything strange. On the first day of the investigation, the investigators concluded that the girl, with a high probability, had left home on her own initiative and run away. They argued that they found no signs of struggle in the house and that five people did not hear anything. It was difficult to imagine a scenario in which Amanda could have been abducted without waking up her friend who was sleeping just a meter away. This version caused outrage among Amanda's relatives. They insisted that the girl had no problems at home and was happy to spend the entire summer in White Cloud. In addition, they pointed out that the girl left all her things, including clothes, in her friend's room. According to the police's version, she decided to run away in just her pajamas. When the news of Amanda's disappearance spread throughout the district, the police received several calls from people saying they had seen a similar girl in different places. This only reinforced the detective's confidence that Amanda had run away from home, but they could not confirm any of these leads. The investigators decided to check the girl's computer, hoping to find some information that could help in the search. They found correspondence with a certain young man and based on this, the police assumed that Amanda ran away to meet him. However, there were discrepancies. There was no mention of a possible meeting in these correspondence and it was about ordinary and everyday topics. Nevertheless, the investigators considered this enough to once again convince themselves of their correctness. At that time, they did not disclose all the details of the investigation, but information about correspondence with a certain guy spread throughout the city, so many local residents also began to think that the girl simply ran away from home. Meanwhile, her relatives were posting flyers and giving interviews to various media outlets. They insisted that Amanda could not have run away on her own initiative, and the police were not putting in all the effort to find her because of this misconception. The investigators did not really use the full range of their capabilities. If they officially considered this case as a kidnapping, they could have involved the FBI and other agencies in the investigation. For this reason, searched for her half-heartedly. They never found any serious leads on Amanda's possible location and the investigation stretched on for several weeks. On the morning of July 5th, mushroom pickers went to a forest located approximately 10 kilometers from White Cloud where they found a human body and reported it to the police. Investigators arrived at the scene and immediately recognized the body as Amanda Link. She was wearing the same pajamas she had disappeared in from her friend's house. Later, medical experts officially confirmed her identity and determined that Amanda had received multiple blows from a heavy object and died on the night of her disappearance. Detectives concluded that the victim had been killed elsewhere and then brought to the forest. They could not find any significant leads. So they decided to interview everyone who knew the girl. Over the next few days, police questioned approximately 400 people, which constituted almost one-third of the entire population of White Cloud. Investigators even used a polygraph, but it did not yield any results. They also decided to take another look at the young man with whom Amanda had corresponded online. The problem was that the word killer was used in his nickname. Police considered the possibility that the victim actually went to meet him and he killed her. However, this version still had many inconsistencies. There was nothing to suggest that the girl would have gone to meet someone in her pajamas in the middle of the night. Furthermore, there was no hints of a personal meeting in their correspondence. The investigator could not identify this person and soon the version of his involvement was no longer considered. In an attempt to get some new leads, detectives decided to study all of Amanda's belongings, which led to a breakthrough. They found her personal diary, which contained very disturbing information. Shortly before her death, Amanda wrote that a certain man had been harassing her and the next several pages were torn out. This diary immediately became the main lead in the case. 
Police tried to identify the man's identity. They talked to all of Amanda's friends and asked if the girl had mentioned anything about this. Several of her friends admitted that she had indeed told them about it and even named the man Cecil Wallace. He was the stepfather of Amanda's friend with whom she had stayed the night. For detectives, this information was a real surprise. They had been looking for the killer all over the town and beyond. And in the end, the possible culprit was in the same house as the victim. But the testimony of the friends was not enough to arrest him. Investigators had no substantial evidence against the man. No DNA samples were found on the victim's body. And the court documents did not indicate whether she had been subjected to violence. Detectives questioned Wallace, but he denied any involvement in the crimes. The police themselves wondered how the man could have done all this unnoticed in a small house where his wife and three children slept. Without serious evidence or confession, they could not detain Wallace. The detectives continued to work on all possible leads. Soon after, an interesting fact emerged. It turned out that Wallace's sister, Candace, worked in the police department that was handling Amanda's case. Moreover, the woman actively helped her brother and his family during the interrogations. She literally told him what to say and how to behave, but that was not all. Five years ago, she was fired from another police department for falsifying a report on her brother's accident. She wrote that he was driving on a road when a deer ran out in front of him. However, in reality, the man was drunk and had an accident. By that time, other detectives were already handling Amanda's case and they questioned the objectivity of the investigation by the local police. However, they could not confirm that anyone other than Candace could be helping Wallace. The investigators questioned the man and his family several more times, but all of this did not yield any results. They continued to look for any leads, but in the end, this case stretched on for several years. During this time, the Wallace family complained several times to the police that their home had been vandalized. The fact that the townspeople unanimously believed that the man was a murderer and that he was being covered up by his sister only increased the negative sentiments. The fact that Wallace continued to live among them freely only intensified these feelings. For years after the murder, in 2008, detectives turned to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children for help. They sent their investigators to White Cloud where they reviewed all the case materials, conducted new interrogations, and tried to find new leads. Ultimately, they came to the same conclusion as the local detectives. There was not enough evidence to make an arrest. Three more years passed and in 2011, the police finally got a new lead that changed everything. A 27-year-old girl from Texas who grew up in White Cloud went to a news website from her old town. There she came across information about Amanda's murder and started looking into it. After reading that the victim had spent the night at the Wallace house, the woman decided to go to the police and tell them something disturbing. In 1998, when she still lived in that city and was 13 years old, she stayed overnight at the Wallace house because she was friends with his second foster daughter. In the middle of the night, a man entered their room and assaulted both of them. He then threatened them to keep quiet. The victims were too scared to go to the police, so they never told anyone about what had happened. But after the adult victim learned about Amanda's case, she decided to contact the police. Furthermore, she wrote a statement to the police which helped investigators to get closer to the arrest of the suspect. They interviewed a large number of White Cloud residents who could potentially have been affected by Wallace's actions and this tactic worked. They were able to find several women who admitted that the man had touched them inappropriately. All of this happened between 1998 and 2002. The victims were then between 13 and 16 years old. Gathering all this information together, in October 2011, police arrested 43-year-old Wallace. He was charged with molesting these victims as well as the man who was officially named as a suspect in Amanda's case for the first time. Knowing all that other women had told them, detectives had no doubt about his involvement in the murder. At the preliminary hearing, he was granted bail of $150,000. And somehow he was able to pay this amount. Apparently his sister and other relatives helped him gather the money. The trial was supposed to begin in a month. While waiting for this, Wallace returned to work. The local residents were unhappy that he had been released on bail. They repeatedly protested outside the company's office demanding that this man be fired. On November 10th, on the day of the first court hearing, an unexpected turn occurred. Wallace did not show up at the appointed time and the police immediately declared him wanted. A few hours later, they managed to find his car in the woods near the city. The man was there too. The only thing was that he had taken his own life. Detectives who did not expect such a turn of events were forced to continue the investigation. 
After the suspect's death, they could only rely on significant evidence that could link him to Amanda's death. They obtained a search warrant for his home, trying to find anything related to her murder. The police examined every corner, tore down some walls and removed floorboards, but they could not find any serious evidence. Afterwards, they shifted their focus to the suspect's sister, Candace. Detectives were certain that she was covering up for her brother and wanted to find out if she knew that he had killed Amanda. After gathering the necessary evidence, Candace was arrested in August 2012. She was charged with intentionally misleading the investigation, but that was only the beginning. During the investigation, detectives found out that Candace had been covering up for her brother during the times when he was dealing in illegal substances. Furthermore, she taught him how to not leave any evidence at the crime scenes. She showed him how to properly wipe his fingerprints off surfaces so that experts couldn't lift them. Candace also advised him to always carry a cigarette with someone else's DNA on it so that if necessary, he could plant it at the crime scene. Detectives also concluded that at least nine people knew about Wallace's crimes but remained silent. All of them were members of his family. The police were unable to prove their guilt. The investigation into Candace's involvement continued for two years until 2014 when she made a deal with the police. She admitted to lying to the investigators and in exchange, two other charges were dropped. The issue was that Wallace's sister could not provide consulting services on a case that she was working on as a police officer. Given that she had been helping her brother through interrogations, she broke this rule and was ultimately punished for it. However, Candace continued to insist that her brother was innocent. The court sentenced her to 30 weekends in jail. This is a dubious practice where the convict is only required to be in the jail building for two days a week and can freely roam during the rest of the time. Such sentences serve as a kind of half measure and if a person has committed a minor offense, they can be given several weekends in jail. This way they receive a punishment but it does not strongly affect their life. The convicted person can continue to go to work and spend time with their family. Of course, Amanda's relatives were extremely dissatisfied with this decision. They, like the detectives, were sure that Candace had helped her brother avoid punishment, but proving it 100% was not possible. Therefore, she got off with such a minor punishment. The Amanda's family was forced to go through yet another trial. In 2004, medical experts only handed over part of her remains to them so they could hold a funeral. The rest was to be kept by detectives during the investigation, but after Wallace's death, a decision was made to hand over these remains to the relatives. In 2013, the girl's family had to exhume her remains to bury Amanda again. Her mother still hopes that investigators will find any evidence that will prove Wallace's guilt. She also tries to achieve changes in the legislation to change the police approach to searching for missing children. The woman insists that investigators should not conduct an investigation based on their subjective assessments and consider the disappearance as a voluntary escape from home. Thus, there is almost no doubt that Wallace killed Amanda. But what was his motive? Considering that there is no information in the court documents, well, whether the victim was subjected to violence, two assumptions can be made. He probably did assault her but did not leave his biological material. So the investigation decided not to reveal this fact since it was unnecessary. Detectives could also keep this information secret for the sake of the investigation, hoping that the criminal would reveal facts that had never been told. His past crimes also speak in favor of Wallace being the killer. He assaulted at least three victims using the same scheme. All of them stayed at his house overnight. The question remains, why did he kill Amanda? Perhaps he planned to intimidate her like the others, but the girl threatened to tell the truth to everyone, or she tried to run away from him and then he panicked. Something else in this case is very alarming. Detectives suggested that all of Wallace's relatives who were in the house on the night of the murder knew about this crime and even helped the man hide it. In addition to Amanda, his wife, son, and daughter were there. This could explain how he managed to attack the victim without waking any of his relatives. In any case, even without a final verdict from the court, Wallace will no longer be able to harm anyone. The fact that he settled the score with his life before the trial once again speaks in favor of his guilt even though he took the details of this crime to the grave. Share your opinion in the comments and don't forget to like this video if you liked it. The student disappeared on her way to the dormitory and at first the police thought that the solution was right in front of them. However, with each passing day of the investigation, they became more convinced that there were many tangled moments in this case and it was only by chance in the end that the truth was uncovered. 
Amy Blunt was born on October 1, 1969 in Homestead, Florida. She grew up in a loving family and had many friends, largely due to her cheerful and kind nature. When she was 14 years old, her father passed away. Despite this painful loss, Amy found the strength to maintain a positive outlook on life. After high school, she enrolled at Flagler College located in St. Augustine, near Jacksonville. Although it was home to only 13,000 people, it was the oldest city in the USA. It was founded by Spanish explorers, so many architectural elements still differ dramatically from the familiar American things. Amy loved studying at college and in three years she made many friends there. By that time she was 21 years old and had only a little left before graduation. On November 6, 1990, her friend Kim came to St. Augustine. They decided to go to a local bar popular among students. Amy's roommate and best friend, Kelly, also went with them. The young women had a great time enjoying the long-awaited meeting. At some point, their mutual acquaintance, Sean Nolan, joined them. He and Amy had mutual sympathy, but they were not in a relationship. In the evening, Kelly said that she felt sick and went back to the dorm, and a little later, Kim also left, leaving Sean and Amy alone. The next morning, the young women had to go to classes. However, when Kelly woke up, she found that Amy's bedroom door was wide open and she was not there. It seemed strange to her, but she decided that she would see Amy in class. However, the young woman never showed up. Kelly and Kim were worried about her absence and decided to talk to Sean, who stayed with her at the bar the night before. The guy worked at a place near the college and the young women went to see him. His story seemed strange to them at first. He said that he had a strong hangover and it was difficult for him to remember the chronology of that night. After gathering his thoughts, he finally told them that after the bar, he and Amy went towards the beach to take a walk. But soon they decided to go home. The guy called a taxi from the nearest payphone and while they were waiting for the car, he and Amy had an argument. In the end, she went on foot to the dorm, which was only a few minutes away. Kelly was upset that the guy left Amy alone and didn't walk her to her dorm. At the same time, she became even more worried. Amy had nowhere else to go but the dorm, but she never showed up in her room. Her friend was afraid that something bad had happened to her and began to seriously suspect Sean. His strange behavior only heightened her anxiety. It seemed like the guy was not at all worried that Amy had disappeared. Kelly decided to continue her search and went to the university campus, asking all her acquaintances if they had seen Amy. The answer was the same. No one had met her that day and no one knew where she could be. At around 6 p.m., her friend decided to call the police. She informed investigators about the young woman's disappearance and they began to check the information. They called all local hospitals, but no one resembling Amy had been admitted. The taxi operators were also contacted, but none of the drivers had picked up the young woman. That night, the police could not find any evidence that Amy had been in trouble or become a victim of a crime. Moreover, at the time, the young woman was already 21 years old, so they did not officially declare her missing, despite her friend's request. By that time, Kelly was 100% sure that something bad had happened to Amy. Realizing that she could not convince the police to start searching, she decided to call Amy's mother. Later, the young woman admitted that it was the hardest call of her life. The next morning, Amy's sister arrived in St. Augustine to participate in the search. The first thing they did was go to the police station where they received the same response. They couldn't start an investigation because there was no indication of a threat to life. The investigators believed that the young woman had simply left for a couple of days without warning. So the sisters, along with Kelly and other friends of the missing young woman, decided to organize their own search operation. They printed flyers with information about Amy and began posting them all over the city. Soon a local television channel came to their aid, spreading information about the young woman's disappearance. All of this led to a large number of volunteers offering to participate in the search. They split into groups and began combing both the city and the surrounding area. Volunteers searched forests, beaches, abandoned houses, but they were unable to find any clues. This continued for three days until the police finally decided to start an investigation. By that time, the whole town was talking about Amy's disappearance, apparently putting pressure on the local police department and forcing them to take action. The first thing they decided to do was to talk to Sean, as he was the last person to see Amy, and here they encountered the first suspicious moment. The guy told them a story that was different from the one Kelly and Kim heard. Sean said that he and Amy left the bar and headed towards the beach, but on the way, they decided to split up and go home. He approached the payphone and called a taxi but when he turned around, Amy was nowhere to be seen. After waiting for some time, he got in the taxi and went home. 
investigators found the story strange. How could a young woman disappear from the street in a matter of seconds and Sean, who was standing a meter away from her, not notice? Moreover, why did he give his friends a different version of events? All of this was enough to start considering Sean as a suspect. Detectives decided to verify his story and find the taxi driver who was supposed to take him home that night, and soon they succeeded. The only problem was that his story also differed from the two versions told by Sean. The driver claimed that he did indeed pick up the young man near the phone booth. However, when he arrived at the location, Sean was sleeping on a bench and the taxi driver had to wake him up. There was no young woman present at the time. On one hand, this provided the boy with an alibi, but on the other hand, he had, for some reason, shared his version of what had happened, which only raised suspicion with the detectives. Despite this, there was no evidence against him, so the police continued to search for new leads. Ten days had passed since Amy's disappearance. During that time, there had been no activity on her bank accounts, which only confirmed that she had not left on her own initiative. By that time, the residents of St. Augustine and the police began to suspect that Amy's disappearance might be related to another series of gruesome crimes, which we have a separate video about. In August of the same year, an unknown maniac killed five students in the city of Gainesville, which was 120 kilometers away. People began to fear that this criminal had moved to their town and that they were all in mortal danger. Investigators contacted colleagues from Gainesville and began to compare the cases. But soon they realized that there were many inconsistencies. The Gainesville killer attacked students in their homes and left their bodies there. In Amy's case, the police didn't even know if she was still alive and what had happened to her. Furthermore, at the time of her disappearance, the police had already arrested a man who was highly likely to be the killer. Several serious pieces of evidence pointed to him. Therefore, soon the detective stopped looking for a connection between that series of crimes and Amy's disappearance. Meanwhile, the police department offered a reward of $10,000 for any information that would help find Amy. They immediately received hundreds of tips, but most of them led nowhere. This happens in any case where authorities offer money for information. People come up with various stories, hoping to get an easy check. It was also about six potentially important leads. Witnesses reported seeing her in different parts of the city. Many of them added that she got into some cars. Out of all this, one call was much more interesting. A man reported seeing Amy in the city center on the night of her disappearance. A fairly old car, similar to a Chevrolet Camaro, pulled up to her. There were two men inside. After a brief conversation with them, Amy got into the passenger seat and they drove off. At that time, this was the most detailed lead in the hands of detectives. However, something in the witness's behavior made them suspicious. After the call, he agreed to come to the station, answered all the questions, and tried to help. But for some reason, the investigators treated him with suspicion. Detectives called it a police instinct and couldn't explain their doubts. They offered him to take a lie detector test to verify his testimony, and the man agreed. They asked him only two questions, whether he had anything to do with Amy's disappearance and whether he could take detectives to her. The witness answered negatively and the polygraph operator did not detect any signs of lying. Thus, investigators understood that they finally had honest testimony that could help find Amy. The police began searching for all cars that fit the witness's description. Establishing the identities of the drivers and checking their alibis for the night of the young woman's disappearance. All of this continued for several weeks, but the detective never managed to find a single potential suspect. Since then, there have been no leads in this case, but on January 1st, two months after Amy's disappearance, a disturbing call was made to the police. A man was walking his dog on the outskirts. At some point, his dog noticed a pile of logs with bricks and started acting strangely, barking and pulling on the leash, trying to run there. The owner decided to see what had so upset his dog and was almost speechless when he saw a skeleton hand sticking out from under the pile. He immediately called the police and investigators began to extract the body. Due to the high degree of decomposition, they were unable to quickly establish her identity, but one detail immediately caught their attention. The body was wearing a green shirt, just like Amy Blunt on the night she disappeared. The body was wrapped in a sheet. Medical experts conducted a more detailed analysis and concluded that the deceased was a young woman. She had received five sharp object wounds indicated by cuts on her shirt. In addition, two serious abrasions were found on the body. Investigators suspected that the victim was Amy, so they immediately sent her dental records to experts, who soon confirmed that it was indeed her. Friends and relatives of the young woman were devastated by the news. They had hoped until the very end that Amy would return to them unharmed. 
Now the police had to investigate her murder. Along with the discovery of the body they received their first lead, Amy had been partially buried and covered with logs on the outskirts of a large private property. Upon learning the name of the owner of this plot, they called him in for questioning. For understandable reasons, the man immediately became a suspect. However, after talking to him, the investigators began to doubt his involvement. First, it was a huge plot of land without a fence and anyone could enter it. Secondly, there were two residential trailers on the property whose owners paid the landowner for rent. He added that he constantly had problems with one of the tenants. When they heard his name, the police were shocked. It was the same witness who had been polygraphed. The man was 22-year-old Timothy Getchell. The police immediately asked the trailer owner to let them search the residence while the man was not at home, and he agreed. The first thing the police saw was a sheet very similar to the one in which Amy's body was wrapped. Upon further search, they found long female hair stuck in the mechanism of a floor exercise machine. It was the same color as Amy's hair. In addition, using special chemicals, forensic experts discovered blood traces in the living room. A sheet of paper with the name Toby and a phone number was also found in the house. The landowner said that a guy with that name did often visit Timothy. The police allowed that this person might also be related to the murder and contacted him. Toby agreed to meet with the detectives and told them his story. On the night of Amy's disappearance, he and Timothy were driving around town, stopping at different bars. At some point, they saw Amy walking alone on the street. Timothy asked Toby to stop the car, got out and approached the young woman. He invited her to join them and she got into the car. Together, they went to Timothy's trailer and had a party. However, Toby's story started to sound strange, like a detective story. At first, he claimed that he just dropped off Amy and Timothy near the trailer and immediately left. Then he changed his version and said that he went inside with them, had a beer, then went to the bathroom and left immediately without going into the living room and got into the car and left. Investigators doubted that he was completely honest with them. They didn't believe that Amy would go to the outskirts of the city with two unknown men at night. In the morning, she had to go to classes and was supposed to go to the dormitory right after the bar. It looked like Toby constructed his story in such a way that he couldn't be made an accomplice. Detectives did not rule out that Timothy and Toby might have actually abducted the young woman on the empty night street, but could not prove it yet. Moreover, Toby told something else. He saw flyers about Amy's disappearance and recognized her. Then he asked Timothy what happened that night. He claimed that he took the young woman to the city center and dropped her off there. After that, she approached another car and soon got into it. Toby told him that he should share this information with the police. Despite the fact that his story raised serious doubts, the police had enough evidence to arrest Timothy. They arrived at his house and the man came out with his hands raised. During the interrogation, he told the investigators the same story. When Toby left, he began to flirt with Amy, but she rejected him. Then he got angry and decided to take her back to the city. Considering that he did not have his own car, he took the owner of the land's pickup truck and drove her to the center where Amy allegedly got into another car. But the detectives immediately realized that this was a lie. At that point, they already knew that the rental pickup truck had three flat and worn-out tires for many months. The investigators immediately told him about it and Timothy became nervous. The detectives asked him, did you kill Amy? And the man replied, I don't know, it seems so. From that moment on, he began to talk about the events of that night. According to him, he didn't remember much of what happened. At some point, he tried to kiss Amy and the next thing he remembers is her holding a knife. He allegedly got scared that she might attack him, so he tried to take the weapon away from her. After that, Timothy didn't remember anything as if he had lost consciousness. According to him, this had happened to him before. He had completely lost some memories. When he came to, he found the knife in his hand and Amy lying on the floor, showing no signs of life. Scared, he decided to get rid of the body. Timothy went to the shed for the shovel and started digging a hole. He then wrapped Amy in a sheet and buried her there, covering the grave with logs and bricks. After that, he prayed to God and went to clean up the blood in the room. With his confession in hand, Timothy was charged with murder. No evidence was found against Toby, so he was only used as a witness. On July 15, 1991, a trial was held where the man planned to defend himself and receive a lesser punishment. He wanted to make it look like self-defense and use the story of memory loss. However, everything changed when the prosecutor addressed the judge and requested the death penalty. Timothy stood up and said he was ready to confess the first-degree murder if the prosecution would drop the death penalty in favor of life imprisonment. 
After some brief consideration, the court agreed to these conditions and Timothy was sentenced to life in prison. Amy's relatives and friends supported this decision. They all harbored hatred toward the person who took her away from them and wanted him to spend the rest of his life. And a prison cell. As for Toby, no charges were ever brought against him. Nevertheless, his story still seems suspicious and I wouldn't rule out the possibility that he was directly involved in the murder. Timothy remains behind bars to this day. He is currently 53 years old. Share your opinion on the story in the comments. Don't forget to give it a like if you enjoyed the video. A first-year student went out dancing with her friends and disappeared without a trace. Several days later, her car was found abandoned under a bridge. The police started an investigation which eventually became one of the most high-profile and iconic cases in the entire state. Although they did eventually uncover the truth, the case continues to haunt detectives to this day. 42 years later, Gina Renee Hall was born on August 24, 1961 in the American state of Virginia. She had an older sister named Deanna and loving parents. However, tragic events followed her in childhood. When she was two years old, she and her mother were involved in a serious car accident. As a result, Gina was seriously injured and suffered third-degree burns. She had to undergo a long course of treatment, but it was impossible to completely get rid of the burns. Her mother blamed herself for the accident and, over time, things only got worse. The woman developed serious psychological problems which eventually led to her leaving the family. But their father did an excellent job of raising the children. Later he remarried and the girls gained a stepmother. After finishing high school, Gina decided to attend a local college to become a nurse. But after the first semester, she thought about changing schools. Her older sister was studying at Radford University and Gina transferred there. This university offered more in-depth education in her chosen field and was generally more prestigious. In addition, the young women could spend a lot of time together as they had been very close since childhood. Diana rented an apartment near the university and Gina moved in with her. From the first months of her studies, Gina had a group of friends with whom she spent a lot of free time. She was thrilled with the university and especially happy to be living with her sister again. Diana was finishing her final year at the time while Gina was only in her first year. During the summer break of 1980, both young women decided to stay at the university and attend additional classes. Gina also wanted to spend more time with her sister before she graduated. On June 28, Gina took her last exam to finish her first year and decided to celebrate. She planned to go dancing at a club with her friends and sister. But Diana decided to stay home at the last minute. Gina was upset about it, but still went to the club with her friends. Around 10 p.m., she took Diana's Chevrolet Monte Carlo and drove to a nearby city where the club was located. At 1 a.m., Diana woke up from a call on the home phone. It was Gina, and from her voice, her sister seemed slightly concerned about something. The young woman said that she was at a lake house with a guy named Steph and soon hung up. Diana thought it was strange. At 18, Gina had never been involved with boys. Throughout her life, the young woman had complexes due to burns covering a significant part of her body, so she always avoided relationships with the absent sex. Diana thought her sister had gone there with other friends and did not attach much importance to it. The young woman woke up at around 6 a.m. and immediately went to her sister's room, but she was not there. The car was also missing from their parking spot. Diana began to worry seriously because Gina should have already returned home. At around 7.30 a.m., an old friend of Gina's came to their apartment. He served in the army and returned home for a few days to see his friends and family. He and Gina agreed to meet this morning. Diana became even more worried. Her sister was a responsible and punctual person and she could not imagine her setting up a meeting with someone close and not showing up. Diana called several Gina's friends with whom she was with that evening, but none of them saw the girl after the club. Then, with this young man from the army, they decided that Gina could have had an accident or someone kidnapped her. They got in the car and drove to the lake, inspecting the surrounding areas around the roads for the Chevrolet Monte Carlo. This task was complicated by the fact that they did not even roughly know which house Gina was in that night. After driving for several hours on different routes, they returned home and Diana decided to contact the police. As usual in those days, the police were in no hurry to accept reports of a missing person. Gina was 18, so the operator advised waiting until the next day to file a report. In the evening, Diana also called her father and reported her sister missing. The man arrived the next morning and they again turned to the police. This time the report was accepted, but they still did not rush to conduct the full-scale search. 
The police still thought that the young woman had just gone out and no danger threatened her. Then Diana, her father, and some of Gina's friends decided to go on their own search again. This time they were met with an alarming discovery. Driving near the bridge on the edge of Radford, they saw Diana's car next to the railway viaduct. The trunk was open and the doors were unlocked. The first thing Diana noticed was that the driver's seat was pushed all the way back, which seemed very strange to her. Gina was just over 150 centimeters tall and she always had to move the driver's seat as close to the steering wheel as possible. Physically, Gina wouldn't be able to drive with the seat pushed all the way back, which led everyone to a very alarming thought. Someone else must have been behind the wheel. In addition, inside the car, relatives noticed several broken handles and a resembling blood was visible on the trunklet. They reported their findings to the police and detectives examined the car more thoroughly. Hairs were found inside that matched Gina's hair color and length. Near the location of the car, they also found one of Gina's shoes and a blue towel. In 1980, DNA analysis was not yet practiced, so the police could not determine whose blood was on the trunk door. The detectives finally started to properly investigate the case because they believed that Gina was dead. However, at the same time, a mass shooting occurred nearby and most of the police were transferred to that case. As a result, a simple road patrolman with no experience in such matters was appointed as the lead detective. Soon after the car was found, another interesting fact emerged saw the car while driving by. The first noticed it around 5 a.m. on the night of Gina's disappearance. Despite the car being parked with an open trunk, he did not suspect anything and thought the car belonged to a fisherman. They really liked to park in that spot because it was close to the riverbank. The second police officer drove by a few hours later. He did not approach the car, but only ran its plates over the radio. Hearing that the car was not in the system as stolen, the officer left. The lead detective spoke with Diana and learned that Gina called her at 1 a.m. and said she was at a house by the lake. At the time, they did not know which exact house she was referring to or whose staff was. Therefore, the officers went there and knocked on every door. Unfortunately, this did not yield any results. Most of the houses were only used on weekends and the residents of the others did not see Gina. Meanwhile, divers began inspecting the river next to where Gina's car was found. It looked as though an unknown person had killed Gina, brought her to the river, and dumped her in the water. However, the divers encountered strong currents and almost zero visibility underwater, leading them to speculate that if Gina's body was thrown into the water more than a day ago, it could have been carried far away. Meanwhile, Gina's father and sister held on to hope that she would be found alive. They didn't rely solely on the police and went to the local radio station to report her disappearance, hoping that someone in the community might have information or be a witness. The detectives focused on finding the Stephen who was with Gina in the house by the lake. He planned to question all of her friends who were at the club, but before he could do so, Stephen himself called the police station and showed up for questioning. He turned out to be 28-year-old Stephen Epperly. Stephen explained that Bill, one of Gina's friends and a member of their group, invited him to the club that evening. They danced and had a good time and then Stephen suggested going to Bill's parents' house by the lake. Bill's parents were away for a few weeks and asked their son to look after the house. Gina agreed and they drove to the house in her car. Stephen drove and after arriving at the house, Gina called her sister. Then she and Stephen went swimming in the lake. When they returned to the house, Stephen tried to kiss her, but Gina refused, saying that she wasn't ready because they had only met a few hours earlier. They spent more time in the house before leaving at around 4 a.m. Gina drove Stephen to his house and then went home. When Stephen heard about Gina's disappearance on the radio, he decided to go to the police station and tell them about that night. The detective asked Stephen to show him the house by the lake and they went there together. On the way, the detective tried to get as much information as possible from Stephen about that evening to understand what might have happened to Gina. Stephen recalled that she had planned to meet an old friend who had just returned from the army that morning. He also remembered that shortly before they left the house, Bill and his girlfriend arrived. The four of them talked briefly before Stephen and Gina left. The detective also questioned Gina's other friends who confirmed Stephen's story that she left the club with him after midnight. Bill told the detective that Steph approached him in the club and asked for the keys. Bill's friend warned him that Steph was planning to come to the house later with his girlfriend and Steph left. However, something interesting happened next. The detectives asked Bill if he saw Gina when he arrived at the house and Bill denied it. According to him, when he and his girlfriend arrived there, Steph was standing in the laundry room drying himself with a towel. 
He said that he and Gina would leave soon and Bill and his girlfriend went to another room. The last thing they heard was the front door closing. None of them saw or heard Gina. The detective found this strange as Steph had mentioned that Gina was talking to Bill and his girlfriend, but Bill denied it. The detectives found nothing serious there, only a few traffic fines. But when he asked his colleagues at the station if they were familiar with this name, several officers told him a number of troubling stories. Staff often got into fights in bars and the police had to intervene regularly, but he was never charged in any of these cases. When Stephen was around 18 years old, the police visited his home several times and because the young man attacked his younger sister and even his mother with his fists, but in these cases, the family refused to press charges, so these incidents did not make it into his criminal record. But that's not all. The detective called several police stations located in other counties where Steph used to live. In one of them, he was told that once the guy broke into his ex-girlfriend's house, beat her and subjected her to violence, but the woman managed to escape. Steph let the victim go to calm the child down. Instead, she ran out with the child to the police station. Despite all this, the young man somehow managed to avoid punishment. Sometime later, he deceitfully lured another young woman to his apartment, saying that they were going to a party with friends. Instead, when the young woman entered the room, he closed the door and subjected her to somehow avoided punishment. With all this information in hand, the detectives began to suspect Steph. The police went to the house by the lake to conduct a search where they found several disturbing discoveries. When Bill spoke with the investigator, he said he did not notice anything strange in the house after Gina's disappearance. But as soon as the forensic team arrived, they found many troubling signs of heinous crime. There was a large blood stain on the living room floor that had clearly been attempted to be cleaned. Blood stains were also found throughout the house, including on the refrigerator door, a dustpan, some shoes, and so on. In addition, the broken ankle bracelet Gina always wore was found in the house. Bill and his parents noticed the disappearance of several items from the house, two blue, one of which the police found next to Gina's car, a bath mat, and a large number of paper towels. But the most interesting thing was that almost all of the cleaning supplies had disappeared from the house, which had previously been well stocked with them. The police found an empty bottle of bleach in the garbage container, along with a long hair of the same color as Gina's. Experts examined blood samples from the house. DNA analysis was still unavailable at that time, but they matched Gina's blood group. Learning all this, Bill shared additional information with investigators. He told them that he heard about Gina's disappearance on the radio and immediately thought that Steph might be involved. In addition to being with her that night, all their friends knew about his criminal tendencies and aggressive behavior. Bill went to Steph's workplace and started asking him about that evening. Steph insisted that he had nothing to do with the young woman's disappearance. But then something interesting happened. When Bill asked him to contact the police, Steph agreed but asked his friend not to tell anyone that he was with Gina that night. He also wondered how many people saw him leave the club with her. Bill also told something else about that night. When Gina left the club with Steph, she looked confused, apparently thinking that all her friends were going to the house by the lake and was in disarray. The next day, Bill and his friends had a barbecue in that house. None of them knew about Gina's disappearance at that time. While they were sitting outside, Steph volunteered to make drinks for everyone and went into the house. He spent a lot of time in there. And when he finally returned, he explained that he couldn't find the bottle opener. The detective thought that, in fact, Steve had been trying to clean up the bloodstains all this time since he hadn't been able to do it completely at night. Despite no direct evidence linking Steph to the crime, the detectives no longer doubted that he was the one behind the murder. According to his version, that evening at the club, he invited Gina to the lake and said that the other friends were also going there. In the house, he tried to kiss her, but the young woman refused and then the man attacked her, subjected her to violence, killed her, and hid the body somewhere in the house. After that, for several hours, he tried to clean the blood and erase the traces of the struggle. When Bill came to the house with his girlfriend, Steph waited until they went into the room and moved Gina's body to the trunk of her own car. Then he drove her to the river, threw her into, and left the car there. The man did not even think to move the driver's seat closer to the steering wheel as it was originally installed. The big problem remained in the story. Gina's body was still not found. In those years, courts rarely sentenced criminals if there was no victim's body. Lawyers could always insist that without a body, it was impossible to consider a person dead with 100% certainty, and there was always a slight chance that the person was actually alive. 
Investigators continued to search for additional evidence and two weeks after Gina's disappearance, they decided to re-examine the place where her car was found. This time, they brought more officers and it paid off. They found the young woman's clothing nearby, covered in blood. Experts found several hairs on it, one of which matched Steph's hair. In addition, they found small particles of foreign fabric. After conducting a series of necessary analysis, they determined that these particles completely matched the carpet in the house by the lake. In addition to the clothes, they found a second towel missing from the house. However, the police admitted that all these things were thrown by the killer after the car was found. As this particular place had already been inspected that day, the detectives did not stop there. In an attempt to obtain more evidence, he contacted a dog handler and he came with his search dog to the place where the car was found. Then something that shocked all the present officers happened. The dog took the trail and headed across the river on a bridge. Then it walked through the streets of Radford, almost circling the entire city when suddenly the dog approached one of the houses, climbed onto the porch and gave the signal to the dog handler. It was a house where Stephen Epperly and his relatives lived. Even the dog handler did not expect such a result. He did not know whose theft was and what he was suspected of. The detective had hoped at best that the dog would lead them to some additional evidence or a body, but in the end the dog led them to the porch of a possible suspect. Later that day, Steph was called in for questioning with the use of a polygraph. He continued to deny his guilt, but the polygraph operator repeatedly detected that he was lying. After the questioning, the investigators told him that their trained dog had just led them to his home. Stephen covered his face with his hands and said something like, what a good dog. However, without Gina's body, he still couldn't be charged with murder. And Steph remained free. When the whole town learned about his previous crimes and the evidence against him in Gina's case, no one doubted his guilt. People came to his house, wrote threatening letters, and the man decided to move to a small town in Ohio. Five days later, a 25-year-old woman disappeared not far from where Steph had settled and a month later her body was found in a cornfield. Local detectives knew that Stephen was suspected in Gina's murder and he immediately became the prime suspect. However, his guilt could not be proven due to the lack of evidence. Bill continued to talk to Steph and tell the police about their conversations. When Stephen found out that Bill had a good lawyer, he asked if he could represent him and even more disturbingly, he asked Bill to ask him if the police could arrest him if they never found the body. The detective understood that the chances of a guilty verdict in court were slim, but after the other young woman's murder, he decided to risk his career and arrested Stephen. He was charged with murder and the case went to trial. The situation was complicated by the fact that an inexperienced prosecutor was assigned to the case who had only been in the position for seven months. Others simply refused to participate in such a complex process, where they had to prove a murder without a body. Surprisingly, the prosecutor did an excellent job. The trial lasted more than three months and ultimately the jury found Stephen Eberly guilty of Gina's murder. The prosecutor presented all available evidence and was able to convince the jury that the victim was dead and that Steph was the killer. As a result, he received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. This was not only the first conviction without a body in Virginia, but also the first time a court accepted a search dog's lead as evidence. Unfortunately, investigators were unable to prove Steph's involvement in the murder of another woman in Ohio. They also continued to search for Gina's body, but these efforts were halted in 1994. In 2016, 36 years after Gina's murder, a local resident came forward to the Radford police. He confessed that his family had been keeping a terrible secret all these years. In 1980, their grandfather, who lived on a farm outside of town, saw two men in a white van pulling a body out of a car near a field. Detectives thought this could be Gina and resumed their search. They were unable to find any remains. But the grandson's revelation led to new searches for Gina's remains. Her sister, Diana, played a big role in this continuing to hope for closure. In 2019, she met a forensic anthropologist who invented a unique method for finding DNA underground. His tool detected the presence of any human biological material and investigators used it in their search. After many months, it bore fruit. In 2020, they found Gina's remains in eight different locations along the river and lake. These were mostly small pieces that would have been impossible to find without special equipment. Only in one case were they able to find a bone fragment that belonged to the young woman. As for Steph, he is still serving his sentence. Despite numerous appeals and attempts to be released early, investigators believe he may have had many more victims. But they have been unable to find the necessary evidence over the years. 
The only comfort for them is that he has been isolated from society and has not harmed anyone else. Feel free to share your opinion in the comments and don't forget to like the video if you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. A young woman was found dead in her own apartment. The police began an investigation that eventually became the longest in the district for years. The case had many shocking twists and turns, but it was only 46 years later that the unexpected truth was revealed. Lindy Sue Beechler was born on January 31, 1956, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. When she was young, her parents divorced and she stayed with her mother. Her father started a new family but continued to see his daughter regularly. Soon he had a son with whom Lindy was in constant communication. After school, she enrolled at Millersville University, a state college located just 10 minutes from home. At the age of 19, Lindy met a man named Philip Beechler and the couple soon married. He also attended courses at the college while working for a car rental company. Lindy herself worked part-time at a local flower shop. After the wedding, they rented an apartment in the Manor Township residential complex just a few minutes from the college. The newlyweds began their life together and were happy with each other. Lindy's happiness was overshadowed by a series of unpleasant events. She began to notice that someone was constantly watching her in this residential complex, but she never managed to see who it could be. The young woman often complained to friends and relatives, but they attributed what was happening to stress after the move. One evening when Lindy was home alone, she noticed a man looking at her through the glass door inserts. The apartment was on the first floor and her husband was at work at the time. The man immediately disappeared, leaving Lindy terrified. Since then, the young woman was afraid to be alone at home, but due to Philip's evening schedule, she often had to be alone until it was dark. Lindy was constantly stressed, and any incident could bring her to panic. Soon after this event, she spent time with her brother and his family at their home. When they heard the sound of breaking glass from the second floor, it turned out that a wall mirror had fallen to the floor and shattered. The young woman was so scared that she started shaking. She asked her relatives to go around the whole house and make sure that no one else had broken in. All the stress was the result of the fact that some unknown man had been watching her for several months. But all of her acquaintances still believed that the young woman was overreacting and that nothing serious was happening to her. On December 5, 1975, Lindy finished her shift at a flower shop and stopped by her husband's workplace before heading to a local store to do some shopping. Around the same time, her aunt and uncle went to their son's basketball game and decided to invite Lindy along as they knew she was afraid to be alone at home and wanted to distract her for a few hours. They arrived at her apartment at around 8.45 p.m. Lindy's aunt approached the door and found it open, which immediately alarmed her. She went inside and saw a knocked-over lamp in the living room, but the worst was waiting for her in the kitchen. Lindy's body lay there. She was laying face down with no signs of life and a meat cleaver with a towel wrapped around its handle was found in her neck. And detectives began investigating the crime scene. The first thing they noticed was that Lindy was fully dressed, which cast doubt on the motive being related to rape. Additionally, no valuables were missing from the apartment, ruling out robbery as a possibility. There were no signs of forced entry on the front door or windows, suggesting that Lindy either knew her attacker and let them involuntarily or the attacker entered the apartment when the door was left unlocked. The fact that Lindy had purchased a lot of groceries and physically couldn't have carried all the bags from the parking lot to her apartment in one go suggests that her killer may have entered the apartment just after she had taken the first load inside and gone back to her car for the second. While the police were investigating the crime scene, Lindy's husband and parents were informed of what had happened. The grieving family members were desperate to see Lindy and had to be restrained by detectives. Forensic investigators found blood stains on the floor and walls, but DNA testing was not available at the time, so they could not compare these samples to Lindy's DNA. They did conclude that Lindy had put up a fight with her attacker. A male shoe print was found in one of the rooms. And medical experts determined that Lindy had received 19 blows from a sharp object. The perpetrator had used two weapons, the meat cleaver from Lindy's kitchen and a second weapon, presumably a knife, that was never found. Later it was confirmed that Lindy had indeed been sexually assaulted, but DNA evidence could not be extracted from the crime scene. At the time, be of much help in solving the case. The police had hoped to find witnesses, but none of their neighbors were home at the time of the murder. Other residents did not notice anything suspicious. However, several people reported seeing a car parked in the residential complex parking lot from around 7 p.m. to 8.40 p.m., which coincided with the time of Lindy's murder. 
Additionally, none of the residents knew the owner of the car. Unfortunately, detectives were unable to locate it and switch to another line of investigation. As is often the case in such situations, the victim's husband became a suspect. Despite Philip being at work and having a solid alibi, investigators did not rule out his possible involvement. Over the next few months, detectives interviewed about 300 people who could have been involved in the murder, but all of it yielded no results. At some point, they began to suspect a local serial rapist who had committed several attacks on women around the same time Lindy was killed. However, they were unable to find any evidence linking him to the case, and the culprit himself died during an attempt to escape from prison. Moreover, investigators found out that at the time of the murder, he was at work, and eventually they stopped considering him as the suspect. For months after the murder, there was a new twist in the case. A 43-year-old woman named Mary was killed 25 kilometers away from Lindy's apartment. She received multiple stab wounds, and the detectives immediately noted that these murders were almost 100% similar, but soon the culprit was caught, and investigators could not find any connection between him and Lindy. The man admitted to killing Mary but denied involvement in the other crimes. After that, the police had no leads and the case went cold for a year. On December 26, 1976, Lindy's relatives went to visit her grave at the local cemetery. Upon arriving, they saw that the gravestone was covered in red paint and heavily scratched. They immediately reported it to the police, but they were unable to find the vandals. Investigators concluded that the perpetrator of the desecration may have been Lindy's killer as no other graves were damaged. The nature of the damage also supported this theory as the criminal clearly harbored animosity towards the deceased in addition to the obvious association with the red paint. By using a knife or sharp object, the perpetrator had to have spent a considerable amount of time damaging the stone in order to completely cover it with deep scratches. Just a few weeks later, something even stranger happened. Chief Donald W. Scheller, whose department was investigating Lindy's murder, received an anonymous two-page letter. The first part was written from the perspective of Lindy's murder. The author took responsibility for the vandalism of Lindy's grave and demanded that the letter be published in the next day's local newspapers. In exchange, the anonymous writer promised to consider surrendering to the police. He then went on to provide several characteristics to help investigators identify him, claiming to be 178 centimeters tall and that he was a man of high quality and weighing 93 kilograms. Living in the western suburbs of Lancaster, having a good job, being single, and having been caught a few years earlier for possession of illegal substances. On the day of the murder, he was also under the influence of drugs. The last part of the letter was a plea for help with the unknown author asking to be caught before he killed anyone else. The second page was a separate letter allegedly written by the killer's friend named Jenny Scrum. She wrote that her acquaintance truly intended to surrender once his letter was published in the newspapers and added that the man was mentally ill. She purportedly added this message while he was sleeping before placing both sheets in an envelope. Police believed that the author could indeed be Lindy's killer, but they did not believe the second part about his friend Jenny. Despite being written in a different handwriting, investigators believed that the perpetrator may have asked someone he knew to write it or use some other method to forge the handwriting. They also failed to notice the similarity of this message to the letters sent by a serial killer nicknamed the Zodiac Killer who operated in California in the 60s and 70s, regularly communicating with the police and newspapers through anonymous text messages. Investigators even considered that he might have been responsible for Lindy's murder. However, this theory was highly stretched. Firstly, the killer was operating on the opposite side of the country. Secondly, by the time Lindy was killed, according to the police, the Zodiac Killer had already stopped his killings. Chief Donald W. Scheller decided not to publish the letter in the newspaper as the author requested. At that time, the police had two suspects and they did not want to compromise the investigation. Detectives did not believe that the culprit would surrender and saw no point in scarring residents with a letter from a mad Anne. Eventually, they began to doubt that the author was actually Lindy's killer. The letter did not contain any details that had not already appeared in the newspapers. The police profiler even suggested that the author of both sheets could be a mentally ill woman who had no connection to the case. He made this conclusion after analyzing the writing style. Despite this, investigators located a woman named Jenny Scrum and, after talking to her, concluded that she had nothing to do with these letters. From that moment on, the police had no serious leads, but they continued to investigate the case. 
At various stages, they had new suspects, Lindy's mother's partner, a regular visitor to the flower shop where she worked, and even one of the investigators on the case. After brief checks, detectives came to the conclusion that none of them were involved in the murder. In 1980, the police had another chance to solve the case. In Florida, they arrested serial killer Gerald Stano, who admitted to killing 41 people. At the time of Lindy's death, his father lived just 10 minutes away from her complex, so detectives considered the possibility that Stano might have been the killer. But they could not find any evidence that the man visited his father and soon stopped considering him as a suspect. Experts were able to extract a male DNA profile, discovering traces of semen on the victim's underwear. The sample did not match any of the suspects that investigators had for 23 years. Since then, the police have not had any significant leads and the case went cold. It was reviewed in 2000, but with no results in the same year, detectives decided to publish a letter in newspapers supposedly written by the killer, hoping it would help them get new leads, but it didn't. Lindy's parents never found out the truth about her murder. Lindy's father passed away in 2000 and her mother in 2007. The next major breakthrough only occurred in 2019 after the case was reopened again, which specializes in genetic research and has helped solve similar cases in the past. Using an innovative method called DNA phenotyping, experts were able to create an approximate portrait of Lydia's killer at the ages of 25 and 60. This method works by studying the criminal's DNA sample and finding information about possible physical traits such as skin color, eye color, hair color, and so on. Such portraits often turn out to be very similar to real DNA holders, although there are exceptions. The killer's portraits were widely distributed through the media. Investigators hoped someone would recognize this man, but in the end, they didn't get any serious leads. A year later, they turned to Parabot Nanolabs again, this time to use the method of genetic genealogy to find possible relatives of any person based on their DNA. Investigators provided them with a genetic sample from Lindy's killer and waited. The main drawback of this method is the incredible complexity of the research. Experts have to study thousands of people eliminating unsuitable candidates until they finally find a relative of the DNA holder. After many months of hard work, they were able to find a person who was distantly related to the killer. He turned out to be a resident of Italy and now investigators could begin to examine his family tree. They were looking for a man who was in the USA in 1975 and lived near Lancaster. To do this, they had to locate and question a huge number of relatives. In Lancaster alone, there were 2,500 people related to the killer by distant kinship. In 2022, the detectives finally found a suitable candidate, 68-year-old David Sinopoli, a man who had never come to the attention of the police in connection with the case. In 1975, he lived in the same complex as the victim, so he immediately became the main suspect. To confirm or refute his involvement, detectives needed to secretly obtain a DNA sample. To do this, they began to follow David, waiting for the right moment. On February 11th, they had such an opportunity. The man flew out to the airport in Philadelphia and, before boarding the flight, threw a paper coffee cup into a bin. The investigators took it and handed it over to the laboratory. Experts extracted his DNA sample and compared it with the semen DNA found on Lindy's underwear. The analysis showed a complete match. David was the killer. He was arrested on July 17, 2022 and is currently awaiting trial. At the time of Lindy's murder, he was 21 years old. He moved into the residential complex a year before the victim moved there with her husband. David was married twice in 1972 and 1987. According to available information, he did not have children. He spent most of his life working at a printing press in a local printing house. And his colleagues were shocked that their good acquaintance turned out to be a ruthless killer. David is now in custody and additional details will only emerge after the start of the trial, but even now there is virtually no doubt that he is the killer. Experts also compared his DNA to the blood found in the victim's apartment and the analysis showed a complete match. Lindy's ex-husband and brother thanked the investigators for being able to uncover the truth and now the guilty party will be punished. Thus, this complex and convoluted case was solved with the help of innovative technologies almost 47 years later. Genetic genealogy is a unique tool that allows the police to find perpetrators based on the tiniest DNA samples stored for half a century. Share your opinion in the comments and don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it.